Welcome to the bonus episode of the Process Automation Podcast from AVB. I am Fran Scott, maker, pyrotechnician and engineering expert. And today I'm going to be welcoming back Victoria Sinclair. And we had a fascinating discussion about the power and potential of offshore wind when it comes to the energy transition. And so today we are going to be diving in deeper to this subject. Okay, Victoria, uh, let's start with the one, two, three. So in one sentence, please, can you tell us your job title? I am Head of Supply Chain Development for Copenhagen Offshore Partners. Okay, in two sentences, what does that actually mean? (laughs) Yes. So I look at ways to develop supply chain, particularly in the UK, so that we can build more offshore wind farms. Nice. I think you did that in one sentence as well. But now we're going to go to the three sentences, which is how does what you do affect me? How does it affect the planet? Sure. So I like to think that it affects the planet because I'm looking for ways to get more offshore wind farms built quicker and cheaper by helping supply chain develop their own capabilities to do that. And I think it affects everyday people because that's how we bring about more renewable energy that then tackles climate change, reduces carbon emissions, and also helps to reduce the bills that you ultimately pay for your electricity in your home. Makes total sense. Okay, so now we know what you do. We have three statements. Uh, Two of them are truths and one is a lie. Statement one, offshore wind farms can be located close to major coastal cities, reducing transmission losses. Victoria, is that a truth or a lie? It's true. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, actually... A really great place to think about locating because coastal cities need a lot of electricity. And in terms of reducing the transmission loss, because of course, the further that the offshore wind farm is away from the cities, then you're going to get losses in heat and sound and just the general energy losses that you have when it comes to transporting electricity some distances. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it is possible to transport electricity long distances, but it's complicated and there's an alternative option and that's preferable. What's interesting for me with this aspect is obviously when it comes to wind farms in general, you need that area, don't you? And obviously with cities, that uh, that area is tight. You need the homes, you need the industry. And so, yeah, it makes sense that you can just, just put it in the sea where people aren't living. <laughs> and so it means you can get that electricity to the cities. But surely this has an environmental impact. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a huge amount of um, work that happens very early in the wind farm to understand what's the environment there right now, what kind of species live there, mostly looking at birds and mammals, um, and what it is that we can do to build around them in a way that doesn't impact them. Um, And there's some incredible advancement technologies out there that look at ways of reducing the noise impact so that marine mammals don't get scared by what's happening, um, and also looking at ways to design the turbines so that birds are less likely to be impacted by them being sighted there. Um, And sometimes it does just mean that you have to pick a location that is less environmentally impactful, and sometimes it means that there's some locations that aren't suitable for offshore wind because they would have too much of an impact a balancing act of working out the right places depending on what happens for the environment. And then, you know, with being located close to a major coastal city, obviously you have to consider if people can see the wind farm and how they feel about that and if it's something they're happy to look at. Really depends on people's personal preferences, but if it is a problem for them to look at and they don't particularly like it, that could be a reason to look at changing the location or alternatively it could be a reason to look at offering local communities, something alternative. So perhaps they might feel happier having a wind farm located close to them if they knew that the wind farm operator was contributing to their community through some kind of funding arrangement, supporting local volunteering initiatives, jobs, etc. And that's something that a lot of developers do right now. So it's obvious that lots of things are thought about when it comes to the placement of offshore wind farms. And I suppose as the technology gets there that we're doing more and more uh, offshore wind farms further out, it's these transmission losses that we're going to need to tackle, aren't we? And so I suppose where do these losses uh, come from and what can we do to mitigate against them? I think the cable manufacturing and innovation is a really exciting area right now where we're seeing lots of improvements that hopefully will mean that in the future we can consider 
distances much further from shore without being as concerned about those transmission losses. Uh, but as well as the actual cable being improved, there's also um, through the interesting ideas developing around the world whereby we could see energy islands being developed. Those would be uh, manufactured islands that you could house different types of technology such as battery storage or hydrogen and you could connect the electricity from multiple different wind farms into that island and then export it in a much bigger interconnector, which is then less likely to suffer the same transmission losses as you might traditionally find. Interesting. And uh, you've given me a lovely segue there into our second statement, uh, which was offshore wind power cannot be converted into hydrogen. I think we know the answer to this, but (laughs) is that a truth or a lie? That is a lie. Offshore wind can definitely be converted into hydrogen. And what would be the advantages of that? It's mainly a big advantage for the consumer, actually, because right now when you have really windy conditions, we have a lot of wind power generating electricity, but not necessarily a lot of demand at that time. So ideally, you would store that electricity somewhere, and hydrogen's a really useful way to store that electricity. Um, It's also a really useful way to not just store the electricity, as you might do in a battery. You can also step up the amount of energy that you have by turning it into hydrogen, it then becomes a really useful energy source for a much bigger customer, as opposed to electricity that might go into your homes, you might then transfer that hydrogen into a large scale manufacturing facility that's operating 24 seven and has much greater electricity demands. Um, So yeah, it can absolutely happen. Right now, is it happening a lot? Maybe not because the technology does need to develop a little bit more before we can get confident about using it, but it's certainly a really exciting area that has a lot of potential. Yeah, so it so it, it is a truth, but it's a like we're working on it. Uh, <laughs> watch this space; it, it can happen, and then we're going to make it happen large scale. Brilliant! And so that brings us on to our third statement, which is quite a mouthful, and it is: by the end of the next decade, offshore wind energy should be capable of generating more than eighteen times the global electricity demand that we currently use in a year. And we know the answer to this, but I kind of don't believe it. Is it a truth or a lie? It's absolutely a truth, yeah. And and it's a truth for for two reasons. It's partly offshore wind and the sheer capability it has to increase in scale. Um, But it's also a truth because as we decarbonize the electricity sector and more and more technology comes online, we will need more electricity. I think if you think about how much electricity you use in your home today versus 10, 20, 30 years ago, it's just going up and up and up. And it's really important that we recognise that that increase is happening, not just in countries like where I live in the UK, but globally, that's happening. Because electricity is fantastic. It's a wonderful thing that can help change and transform people's lives. So we need more of it, but we need more offshore wind if we're going to help support that demand. Gosh. And it's, yeah, it's, I suppose it's not just putting in more offshore wind farms, it's making the ones that we do put in so much more efficient, uh, putting them in places where we can't put them at the moment. It's a big holistic approach and it's a big ecosystem of development that all needs to work together to make this happen. Now, uh, Victoria, to wrap up, um, you are obviously all about offshore wind. And we know that when it comes to the energy transition and so the world moving away from fossil fuels, that we're going to need to look to renewable energy. For you, what role does offshore wind play in this? And is it the answer that we're all looking for? Why is it exciting? I think for me, what's exciting about offshore wind is that it's it's all about this transition. We live in a, a complicated world that needs huge energy demands. Um, and a lot of that is about finding the right mix for the right level of security, the right level of cheap electricity, the right level that helps populations and communities thrive without feeling concerned that they don't have access to cheap electricity to help them do so. Offshore wind can provide huge amounts of electricity to do that, but it also minimises the impact that you have on the environment. Oil and gas traditionally does have a higher impact on the carbon emissions, therefore a higher impact on climate change. And we know now that we have to look for ways to move away from that Offshore wind is a natural progression. It takes all the skills and knowledge that we've developed from oil and gas, it takes them into an industry that can turn that into something much more beneficial for everybody without disregarding the tradition that we have in energy industry and trying to recognise that there is benefit from what we achieved in oil and gas. It's just that we need to progress that forward now into a new technology. 
genius. Victoria, thank you so much. What a, what a world of this offshore wind. Um, I am I am a convert. Great. I'm glad to hear it. It's a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, but that does bring us to the end of this bonus episode. Of course, a massive thank you to my guest, Victoria Sinclair, who is the Head of Supply Chain Development at Copenhagen Offshore Partners. I am Fran Scott, and the Process Automation Podcast is a fresh air production for ABB. Follow now from wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. See you next time.